once again, good to see everybody here. Folks have been traveling this week, we've been out camping, and it's good to see everybody back in one piece. Hope that the uh, week has gone well. Well, uh, as, we, as we dive into things here tonight, we've spent a number of weeks unfolding some of the key areas in which God wants us to stand for His truth in fighting for our families. And we're coming down to the end of this series. We might have uh, one or two more studies in total in this series, but we're coming down to a few uh, areas that are really um, going to help summarize, I think, the entirety of our study. In Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14, we got our theme for the series. Nehemiah had led the people of Israel back from captivity in Babylon to rebuild the crumpled walls of the Lord's city. It's a lot like what we have going against us today. Walls that are crumbling in the family unit. Devastation. And while they were there, Nehemiah and the Israelite people faced tremendous obstacles in rebuilding their homes there. And as they faced those obstacles, Nehemiah encouraged the people in this way. He said to remember the Lord, who is great and terrible. Fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. That's how you overcome the obstacles. That's how you rebuild the foundations. Nehemiah realized that. There was a lot of hard work that was involved too, but that was the foundational principles. Remember the Lord. Obey Him. And get busy and fight for your families. Now we've discussed many areas of the home. The roles of moms. The roles of dads. The role of parents. We've talked about the role of children, son. We've talked about... The role of husbands and the role of wives. In all of those areas, there are intense attacks upon the home. And an intentional attempt by the culture to undermine God's ways in the home. It's blatant. It's obvious. It's blasphemous. It's very pointed. Tonight, I call your attention briefly... To an area that every one of you can have a direct and lasting impact to bring sincerity and godliness into your home. No matter what anyone else does or does not do, no matter what the world does, no matter what the culture does, no matter what your church does, no matter uh, what others in your extended family do or don't do. Now because of the neglect in this particular area, homes that should be called Christian homes are crumbling, and the foundation is either eroding away or has nearly completely been eroded and destroyed. Now, folks, I've challenged you to come to these services, to come to these studies with prepared hearts, expecting God to do a miracle in your heart. And in the heart of someone else. Do you really believe that God can change someone through these studies that we're doing? That He could bring lasting revival and complete transformation of a home? If you do, then I invite you into God's Word with me tonight as we seek for some life changing truths. And I'm just going to try to express my heart some this evening, but I want to concentrate our whole attention tonight on the power of a praying family. And specifically the power of praying parents and the impact that they can have in the lives of their children. Now, if you're not a parent, don't let this pass you by because you can make... Just as big of an impact in your home through legitimate, intensive, and sincere prayerfulness. The sad reality is that parents raise their children 
And some of those children go haywire, don't they? Some of them don't serve the Lord. And they're like the prodigal son that we read about in Luke chapter 16. I'm not going to go there and read and study that tonight. You should know the story pretty well. Now, if children are raised properly, we have to trust God to continue working in their lives. Bring them back around to the truth that they had invested in them. However, I'm actually ignorant enough to sincerely and earnestly believe that if a parent raises their children with intentional, principled, prayerful, scriptural training, they will, as a rule, doesn't mean there might not be an exception once in a while, but they will, as a rule, follow the Lord and grow to zealously love and serve Him. That burden rests on the shoulders of parents to bring that type of training into their children's lives. The heart of prayer that we put into our children and into our homes can and will make the difference if we're serious about it. And so the question is, how seriously should we take this? How, uh, not, I'm sorry, not how seriously should we, how seriously do we take this? I want to show you a passage of scripture tonight that should shake every one of us to our core in this area. We're going to see in this scripture a mother pleading for her child to Jesus. It's in Matthew chapter 15. It's a remarkable story. That's a story, I'll admit, over which some people have stumbled. They've had difficulty grasping it. And they said, Jesus seems rude here. He seems so out of character. What's really happening? <laughs> well, we're going to see a little bit of that tonight. And I'm in Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And so we get the sense here that she came and she made her plea. And they didn't answer, and they continued walking and traveling. And now here she's following along. And she's continuing her plea. And the disciples are saying, she's being such a distraction. Send her away. Get her out of here. <clears throat> but he answered and said, I am not sent but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat, or not appropriate, to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. This parent had incredible obstacles to overcome, to bring her demonically influenced daughter to the Lord. But we can see as we read through this portion of scripture that she would stop at absolutely nothing <clears throat> to overcome those barriers and cling to God's assistance to accomplish what needed to be done in her daughter's life. What a prayer we see here. What a woman we see here. What a mother. Why was this child demon possessed? You know, if you were to study and understand some of the background, it would probably help. This woman was from Lebanon. She's from Canaan, it says. Her background was no doubt filled with the religion of the Canaanites. You don't have to read back very far into the Bible, read into the Old Testament to see some of the Canaanite religion and the debauchery that accompanied it. It was a very pagan religion. 
It was filled with sexuality and filled with occultism, demonic practice. By the way, you'll be interested, the more that you learn and the more that you study, both in the Bible and also in our culture, to see that those two things always go hand in hand. Sexual perversion and demonic influence or demonic activity, that's something that Satan has always worked to try to twist and destroy in families, in relationships, and just in general, because God designed it for a very specific purpose. But the Bible talks about, uh, in the Old Testament, about several different times it states the sins of the fathers being visited upon the next generation. And so what you find is that demonic influence and deep sinful behaviors actually tend to move in family lines. Almost like a family curse that's passed on from generation to generation. That's the power and the influence that parents can have on their children, by the way. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, there are some powerful statements that are made in the Ten Commandments about worshiping things other than God. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Take it to the bank, folks. This is a promise of God that's made here. You, you can't afford not to put in the diligent effort every single day to make sure that your children are charted in the right direction in their lives. <clears throat> Let this thought terrify you. Let it motivate you. It does me. God's promise again, you break my commandments and you seek fulfillment and other gods, other things that you might worship and place before me, that's going to be visited on your children for generations to come. And I'll show mercy for generations on those that love me and invest in me. That's God's promise. And so, apparently this child that we see back in Matthew chapter 15 was influenced demonically, at least partially, because of that. The Canaanite religion was an awful thing. And here you have, we don't know how old this, this girl is. Um... Presumably just a little child. And yet she's possessed demonically because of the wicked religion and, um, and practices of her ancestors. I don't know whether this child did something of her own volition to invite these demonic powers and influences into her life. But thankfully, even today when that happens, this cycle can be broken. By the power of the gospel. And a parent who's not partially, but absolutely committed to the Lord's cause and to the Lord's truth. And they'll stop at nothing to make sure that their children follow in that path. And so this woman is a Canaanite. And Jesus is heading to the northern part of the region where Lebanon is today. Tyre and Sidon, you see it frequently called in the Bible. Those are some of those seacoast towns. Jesus is there in the area. She hears about Jesus and that he's able to deliver from demons, amongst many other things, and that the demons obey his very word. Something that wasn't known by anyone else, by any other religion. There was no deliverance from this. But there was with Jesus. And somehow news travels about Jesus that far. All the way to these northern coasts of Palestine. Now there's no doubt that there's no way she could have left and visited Jesus. Down in the southern part of the country in Jerusalem. Try to find out where he is. But the good news is that Jesus comes into her area. To make his grace available for that family. By the way, if Jesus will travel 
to the ends of the earth to bring his grace. Don't you understand that he wants his grace to be intimately known in your home and family as well? I've tried to emphasize this regularly, but friends, let me remind you again with sober spirit tonight that we are in a spiritual war as God's children. And in the home. And we better understand that as we seek to stand for God, we'll be met with all of the fury of hell itself to undo our slightest efforts when it comes to spiritual uh, growth in the lives of our children. Satan wants your home. He wants it. He wants your sons. He wants your daughters. He wants your firstborn child, which is such a critical role in the home. You see so much emphasized in the Old Testament about the firstborn children. What a key role they played in their families and in their homes. That wasn't just a cultural thing. There's something so critical and important about our firstborn children learning to love and to serve God. The influence that they have on their brothers and sisters that come after them is phenomenal. And so Satan wants them. He wants parents to be powerless and impotent. He wants parents to be exasperated. He wants them to be giving up. He wants them to feel like failures. Now we're going to see that this mother's child was in desperate need of deliverance by Jesus Christ. So what are some of the barriers that this mother had to recognize and push through to get her child to Jesus at all costs? There are many barriers that are very similar to what we face today. Number one... She overcame the barrier of her religion. You know, she could have said, there's no way, absolutely no way in this world that I'm going to go to a Jew to get help for my child. After all, we Canaanites have our own religion. We've got our own beliefs. We've got our own helps. Can't you just imagine it? There are, there are people today, all around us, who hide behind their religion as a reason for not receiving Christ as Savior. They say that because of their culture, because of their ethnic background, because of their religion, well, they'd be betraying their parents if they were to believe in Jesus, or if they were to go to a different church that actually preaches or teaches the truth. We're going to betray somebody here. And so she overcame some of those barriers. She was willing to bear whatever reproach was necessary, not only religiously, but culturally. Because the Canaanite people were despised by many of the Jewish people. And vice versa. The Canaanites were outcasts. And she could have said, I'd rather see my child suffer a demon than try to go to a Jew to help or to find help. I mean, she, she very well could have said that, and I have no doubt that there were many people that did say that kind of thing. It would be something like a Palestinian in the, in the Gaza Strip reaching out to a Jew for help today. You just don't do it with those kind of cultural roots that are established. And so she overcame her religion. She overcame her culture. And she overcame a divided family. I can't say too much about this because we don't know exactly why her husband, what husband wasn't there with her. It's possible he was just out in the fields working. Maybe he had died. Whatever it was, the point was that she was there as a single mother soliciting the help of Jesus. And many times today, Many people find themselves as single mothers all throughout our culture in this same predicament. The husband may no longer be in the family. Maybe there's been a divorce. Maybe there's been a death. Maybe he's alive but just very, very disinterested. And it's up to you to do something. Can you imagine a day, if you know about the culture, when... The role of a woman was so diminished. 
You know, it, it doesn't matter. No matter what, uh, what uh, diminished value was placed on women in those types of pagan cultures. In a male-dominated culture, this woman goes to 13 men who are in the area. There's Jesus and there's the 12 disciples. And she doesn't care. Her child needs deliverance at all costs. No matter what the stigma, her child needs a word from the Lord. She needs a touch from Jesus. She overcomes her religion. She overcomes her culture. She overcomes her divided home. And then she also overcomes something that's very, very interesting here, and that's the silence of Jesus himself. She comes, and it's, it's amazing to me, in the first place, that she knows who Jesus is. She got some good theology somewhere along the line. And she comes and says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. There was some scriptural understanding that this woman had. She knew something about David. She knew something about the royal line. She knew something about the Messiah that would come from David's line. And so she comes saying, have mercy. How would this stranger have mercy on her? Well, she knew something about who he was. She knew something about his deity. She knew something about, uh, about him being the Messiah. And so she makes this request, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her, not a word. Would you have been put off by that? Put yourself in her shoes. I mean, she had overcome all of these obstacles just to go and engage with him in some way. Those of you who are praying for your children... Those of you who are praying for somebody in your home or in your family, are you put off by the silence of God that you experience sometimes? The seemingly uh, indifferent response, your child is out there needing help, needing a word from the Almighty, and that word just doesn't come. Day after day. Nothing changes. And you begin to wonder if God's listening. If God cares, if He's ever going to answer. This woman knew. And parents who are praying for their children and their families must know that the silence of God is never a sign of indifference from God. It's not that He doesn't care. It's not that He's indifferent. And even here when Jesus is silent, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that he had something going on in his mind. There's, there's a reason for what he's doing here. He's secretly planning mercy for that child. Personally, I don't know about you, but I happen to think that that's exactly why Jesus went into Tyre and Sidon on that trip. It's because he knew that there was a woman there who needed him. There was a child who needed deliverance. People think that Jesus was rude because of his response here. He seems to be so out of character with the way that he reacts in other places in the scripture. Well, the only answer <coughs> is that we have to find something within the text itself about what Jesus was after here. And we do see something as we continue on. And so, and so she, she pleads with him. There's silence. There's no response. She was not put off by the delay in Jesus answering her. She was there for the long haul, folks. Now, parents, I want you to really key into that. She was there for the long haul. She was not going to be deterred because she knew that Jesus was the only thing that her child so desperately needed. She overcomes the temporary silence of Jesus and through the eyes of faith realizes that she has to stay after it. She overcame something else here as a parent. She overcame the rejection of the disciples, didn't she? Notice that it says, And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And they were saying, She's a nuisance. Keeps crying after us. 
Get rid of her, Jesus. Just tell her to go away. Now, there you can even see a little bit of the prejudices and the animosity between the Jewish people and the Canaanite people. They had no concern or care whatsoever that this woman had such a desperate need in her home. They didn't care about the spiritual need. They are focused on some of the other um, peripheral, silly, shallow things. Now, at this point, if you had been this woman, would you have backed off and said, enough already? If that's the way that these Jews are going to treat me, after I came out here and I sought their help, that's the kind of cold shoulder that I get. Send her away. I'm out of here. Put yourself in her shoes. That doesn't deter her. She doesn't stop. She's undistracted, unoffended. She isn't there for herself, folks. She isn't worried what people think. There's one, and only one, overshadowing reality for her. I have to maintain my focus to get my child to Jesus. That's it. Somehow it has to happen. And then you'll notice that the text that we read goes on to say some of the words of Jesus. He says in verse 24, when he finally does speak, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She hears it. The disciples hear it. And it's very clear to them, and that's exactly why they say, send her away in this context. Now, what Jesus was saying was really true, at least at face value. God's salvation was sent to the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles, then to the Greeks. We see that several different times. That was the chronology of how the gospel went out. Of course, Jesus is the Messiah. But for now, he says, I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's my agenda. That's my focus. That's why he came. When he sent out the, uh, the 70 disciples on one occasion, his command was, go only to the houses of the lost sheep of Israel. And so Jesus said, well, that's my mission. And he speaks correctly. But again, what she hears is prejudice. That's what she perceived. I'm a Canaanite. You Jews get all the blessings. That didn't stop her. She was still undeterred and unoffended. And notice in verse 25, it says that after Jesus said that, she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. It still isn't over for her. She's relentless. And Jesus then says these words. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's not right for me to give what is designed for the children, throw it to the dogs. You know, the Gentiles, the Canaanites, were called dogs by the Jews. It's the way that they looked at them. I mean, you talk about some tremendous prejudice that they had. That's very clearly seen in their lives. That's the New Testament expression as it reflects the culture and the sentiment of the day. Jesus is saying, you know, the Jews are the children. And they get fed. And there's some special benefits and blessings for them. But we can't take food from them and then give it to the Canaanites, the dogs. Now, I, I'm not going to get too lost in the weeds here because I don't want to get off track from, from the main theme of what I'm trying to drive home to you. So don't get confused or twisted up about that. If you're really struggling with Jesus at this point, if you're saying that Jesus seems to be harsh and uncaring, it might help you to know that, that in the Greek there are a couple of different words for dogs. One is for those ferocious, savage scavengers that roamed the country in packs. It's not the word that Jesus uses here. Jesus uses the word that was typically used just for a, a household pet. You could almost say, um, it's not right to take the food that belongs to the children and give it to the, the puppies that are around the table. The little dogs. He may have even said that with a little bit of humor, maybe poking fun at the culture of the day. But notice her response. She doesn't disagree. 
She recognizes the, the unfolding scheme of God's design in bringing his truth into the world. And she doesn't respond with, how prejudiced can you really get? She agrees and she says, absolutely. I don't want anything that belongs to the children. Whatever it is that you give me, I don't want it to diminish from what the children get because they deserve it. But she says in verse 17, yes, Lord. But even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Even the puppies get to lick up the crumbs. You guys ever had a puppy before? That's what they do. They hang around the table, don't they? Drop anything, they're right on it. Like they're better than a vacuum cleaner. They're fantastic. And so she says, I'm not asking the Lord for a full meal. I'm just asking for a few crumbs. That's all that it takes. I'm asking for a little bit of spillover of your blessing to me because I'm in a desperate situation and my child needs you. Lord, those crumbs are just going to be swept away. They're just going to be swept up anyway and thrown away. So unappreciated by the children. Can't you just give us that? You know, I read this yesterday. As I was studying it even now, I find tears come into my eyes as I think about this. Can you imagine this woman? This mother. And this is her thought, and this is what she's willing to admit in deep humility about her background and where she comes from and what it is that she needs. And Jesus finally says this, having reached his desired goal, O woman, great is thy faith. Your faith is phenomenal. Let me pause here for just a second to say that there's only two times ever recorded in the Bible that we have Jesus say, you have great faith. Two times only. He said it to this woman who was a Gentile, a Canaanite. And he said it to a Roman centurion who was a Gentile. You know, when Peter was about to go under the water, we think about how great his faith was, right? Boy, he got out there and walked on the water. And then he started to sink into the water. You know what Jesus said? Oh, ye of little faith. Can't even walk on water. Well, here's something. Here, here's something that's phenomenally more incredible and more important than that. Over and over, Jesus said to the disciples themselves, these twelve apostles that were so prejudiced, "O ye of little faith." You see him say that over and over again. They had little faith. To this woman, Jesus said, "You have great faith. Be it unto you, even as you will." And her daughter was healed instantly. Instantaneously. Can I ask you tonight, at what point would you have stopped your intercessions? At what point would you have stopped pleading with God? Would you have stopped at the silence of God? God's not answering, and years have gone by. Why should I continue to pray? Would you have stopped because of the influence of other people in the church? Like these disciples who said, send her away. <laughs> Showed their prejudice and their judgy spirit. But sometimes God's people can be the most judgmental people that there are. They can be very, very difficult to live with. It can be like the older brother of the prodigal son. Right? It can be obnoxious. Would that have stopped you? Would you have said, I'm not going to intercede for my child anymore. Nothing seems like it's going to change. Somebody said that this woman scaled the walls of heaven and touched the heart of God. By the time she came through all of these barriers, some of which were inappropriately erected by the disciples, and some that were put in place even by Jesus himself in order to test the sincerity of her faith, Jesus could say, woman, great is your faith. Great is your faithfulness. She really believed that God was going to intervene for her home. She wasn't going to stop until she diligently pursued him and received the blessing of God on her child. 
I think that there's another reason why Jesus answered her prayer. And it was because of her desperation. She was absolutely desperate. There was no way that her child was going to be healed. No way that her child was going to be delivered. She couldn't have gone there herself and affected any kind of change at all. But if you don't have the Word of God, who are we? Who are you and I as parents, as Christians that can stand against evil powers? We've got nothing. You know, God loves desperate people. Why aren't our families changed, folks? Why aren't our children changed? We aren't very desperate, are we? We aren't very diligent, are we? We aren't very serious about this business, are we? Friends, let God see a sense of desperation in us, knowing that our children will come to Him only as we diligently seek Him and rely on Him. As we diligently pray for our families, for our homes, as our children look at us and they see the sincerity of the expression of our faith in the Lord and our walk with Him, and as Jesus' own personal touch is brought into their lives through parental influence, through the influence of other sincere believers. When you look at the story here of the Canaanite woman, it's very clear that, that Jesus didn't just want to do a work in her child. Did he? I mean, that was part of it. Jesus wanted to do a work in her too. He wanted to solicit from her the kind of brokenness, the kind of worship, and the kind of faith that he could commend and use as an illustration for you and me today. 2,000 years later. And those are the very things that we see her exemplify in this story that's recorded. I hope that you've caught my heart some today. I hope that you've caught the heart and the message of what God's trying to convey to us through this scripture. Pray for your family. Pray with your family. You know, at the birth of each one of our five children, Jen and I um, have waited for a quiet moment <laughs> when all the activity dies down. The very first thing that we've done as parents of each of our five children, long before we named them or anything else, sometimes that took a while. The, the first thing that we did was to pour our hearts out before the Lord, praying for God to protect their hearts, guide them through His Word to Jesus for salvation. Countless times through the years, during uh, during sleepless moments, frequently with planned intent, I've snuck into my boys' bedrooms late at night after they were asleep, and with a, a deep, crushing burden on my soul and on my heart that I can't even really convey to you today. I poured out my heart with tears before the Lord, asking God to touch my children's hearts so that they would love and serve Jesus. And I don't want them to do that because they know that it means so much to me, but because of a sincere love and trust in Him for who He is. Parents, let your children see that sincerity in your life as you live before them, as you lead them in spiritual learning, as you pray for them, and as you pray with them. Folks, the power of a praying parent, the power of a praying family member is a phenomenal thing. Whether it's a Canaanite woman of 2,000 years ago, or whether it's your life and my life today, God is waiting for our faith to put a stake in the ground saying, Satan, you will not have my child. You will not have my family. 
I insist upon this. I'll not stop praying and seeking. I will not be discouraged. I will not be deterred. Recognize, folks, that the war in which we are engaged takes grit and determination. It takes God's grace. And it takes prayer. And prayer is one of the most critical weapons in the arsenal that God has given us. And Jesus, I strongly believe, will say this. O oh, son or daughter, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Let's pray.